What's up, guys? As you know, the NBA playoffs are almost at an end right now, so I'm going to keep riding the wave of NBA videos until they are over. And that's why mm -hmm. my newest NBA video, I'm going to look at my all-decade teams from every single decade in the history of the NBA since the 1950s. Now, there's a couple guidelines I want to drop before I start the video. I'm going positionless, meaning I don't care about guard, guard, forward, forward, center. It's just the five best players overall As from that decade, be. regardless of position. I am also using just specifically the 10 seasons from that decade. Now, this seems pretty self-explanatory, but this is not a career-based video. For example, when it comes to the 2010s, I'm looking specifically at what all these players accomplished between the 2009-10 seasons and the 2018-19 seasons. And when it comes to the 60s and 70s, I do not care about what a player did in the ABA. This is strictly what they did in the NBA. So guys like Dr. Dr. J, J, Artis Gilmore, yeah. you're out of luck. So get ready. Ready to get buddy. butt hurt right after this. I want to take a moment and say thank you to Ooh. DraftKings for sponsoring this video. Basketball fan fantasy, Go Barry, bag, Magic right. Bird, or specifically Little Michael Reed. Jordan, because every NBA debate basically devolves into LeBron versus Jordan, LeBron versus Kobe, LeBron versus Steph. Most of you people don't actually like basketball, so I'll make this quick as possible. Starting it off with George Mikan. Mikan was basically the 1950s equivalent of Shaq or MJ. He was the first real superstar, and he won four championships with the Lakers, although his career was pretty short. That being said, when you were talking era-specific, he is you know, I, I, I will say this, man. When it comes to that whole Lakers-Celtics shit, motherfuckers want to rag on the Celtics because, like, a lot of our championships came in the 60s. Man. Five of them Lakers championships came in the 50s, man. 50s! 1950s! Shit kind of crazy, man. Is it lagging? Am I lagging? Am I lagging? Jesus Christ. Holy moly. No? Oh, okay. Okay. One of the most dominant players in the NBA, even though I think we all know he would probably be Mason Plumlee if he played today. No offense. Bob Cousy. Yes, that's right. The that's a hairy of chest. the hardwood. And that's, that's Cousy, Worcester's finest right now. extremely there. inefficient, never right shot over 40% in any regular season of his career. Makes this list because, again, this is era specific. Would Cousy be a good player in today's NBA? Of course not. He'd be a lesser version of TJ McConnell. But for his time, he was basically Magic Johnson or Steve Nash, leading the league in assists in each of the the last seven seasons of the 1950s. He also won two of his six rings in the 1950s, although he didn't win anything until Bill Russell came along. But no matter what you think of Cousy, you cannot deny that his cameo in Blue Chips was absolutely amazing. Paul Arison. Yes, that's right. Paul Arison once led the league in field goal percentage, shooting below 5%. He also five led only. the league in scoring twice. But more importantly, and I made sure to leave this in there, he voluntarily skipped two seasons of his NBA career in his prime to serve in the Marines. So if you say any negative things about Mr. Arison in the comments, I will find you. And his playoff numbers outside of 1957 when he was hurt are actually pretty darn good regardless of era, including winning a championship in 1956 with the That's Philadelphia cool. Warriors. That's Pitch and cool. Paul had game regardless of era. Dolph Shays. Much like Bob Cousy and many other players from the 1950s, Dolph Shays had terrible... Yo, I, I will say this about old school basketball... I know this is such a crazy take to say. But <laughs> I was doing the Jordan Challenge in 2K. The first Jordan Challenge is UNC versus Georgetown. It wasn't the hardest thing in the world. But let me just say this. Playing basketball where everyone isn't a fucking shooter... Um, and there's no three-point line, and everything is just clogged in the paint, and there's no scoreboard. It's, it's different, bro. I, I, ain't, I ain't gonna lie. It's, it's different. It's, it's insane. <laughs> I don't know if y'all got 2K23 in the chat, but, yo... Patrick Ewing, cheat code, bro. <laughs> if 
fucking fucking cheat code, bro. Um, and I think in the the either the fifties or the sixties too, they were much stricter on rules like carrying. So the way that they dribbled, it wasn't even just because the game was so primitive. That's part of it too. It was literally because they were so strict on the carry rule that like Bob Cousy had to dribble like this. You know what I'm saying? Because any motion of like this might have been considered a carry type shit. I don't, I don't know, man. Shit, shit is just different. Shooting percentages and would most likely not be relevant in today's era. However, he could score, he could rebound, and he could pass a little bit. He also upped his game in the playoffs. Now, admittedly, it's not that difficult to increase your game efficiency-wise when you're shooting below 40% every single season. But nevertheless, he did so, winning a championship in 1955. He also had the most win shares of any player in the entire decade if you get off on advanced stats like that. Also, his son Danny Shays played a long time in the NBA, so congrats to Dolph on having sex. And finally, Bob Pettit. Bob Pettit, one of the earliest superstars in the history of the league. The bombarder from Baton Rouge, as he was known, talks like Foghorn Leghorn, but he had game. Although he would continue the to is play broken, great right? into the 60s, no, it's in not just, just the me, 50s, he had two scoring titles, two me. MVPs, okay. and a championship in 1958, which is the only time between 1957 and 1966 that a team This is, other this than is the 50s chat, so Jerry West is probably going to be in the Russell 60s. Russell was injured in 1950. So some might even dare call Bob Pettit the Steph Curry of his era. My player of the decade, George Mikan. To me, the combination of relative individual dominance and four championships, even though he did not play for basically half the decade, gives him the top spot for me. The 1960s. Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> this was a like pretty easy choice, as Wilt is one of the greatest players of all time. Won seven scoring this is titles, just first team, eight right? rebounding titles, all and teams, okay. a championship, as well as four MVPs. He also somehow avoided any paternal suits despite if if it's positionalist for the 60s i'll probably go bill wilt jerry oscar elgin i feel like i'm missing a name though i think that would be my five i think that'd be my five having sexual relations at least 50 times a day in between games. Perhaps if he was focused more on playing instead of laying, he might have won more championships. But despite that, Crazy and having the misfortune of having to go up against the Dynasty Celtics, Chamberlain's individual dominance is so extreme that he's one of the few players that everybody pretty much unanimously agrees would translate to the current era because he was arguably- My thing is, how did he not lead the league in minutes averaging 48.7 points a game? Who was averaging more than 48.7 points a game, bro? Oh, Lee. The greatest athlete in the history of not just the NBA, but I know it's the playoffs, sports. but damn. Oscar Robertson. The big O was incredible. He is most famous for averaging a triple-double, which Russell Westbrook has basically made irrelevant now. But for a long time, it was very important. He was extremely efficient, especially for a guard in his era. He won seven assist titles in the 60s and a scoring title, as well as an MVP in 1964. The one issue with Oscar the Grouch, as he was known, is that he really did didn't have as much team success as you would expect, even considering that he was playing in an era with Russell and Wilt. Did I say something else? Did I say point? I was I was thinking minutes in my head. I was thinking minutes in my head. Maybe that yeah, my my bad. My bad, gang. My I I, I was literally saying that sentence with minutes in my head. I ain't that dumb. Jesus Christ. Jeez. But nevertheless, he was a baller and is rightfully considered one of the greatest point guards of all time, Jerry West. While Chamberlain versus Russell was the biggest debate among NBA fans back in the day, Jerry West versus Oscar Robertson was another that wasn't quite as popular, but still very interesting to look at. West is known by many names, the logo or Mr. Clutch, even though he was famously known for losing the most finals in the history of the NBA. He was also known for having incredibly shitty luck and consistently raised his individual performances in the 
postseason, including averaging over 40 points a game in the 1965 playoffs. West unfortunately went 0 for 6 in the NBA Finals in the 60s and still remains the only losing player to ever win Finals MVP, which he did in 1969. But there's any person that has reason to hate the Bill Russell Celtics more than Jerry West. I haven't seen him. The other thing is that his numbers could have been even better if they had a three-point line when he was playing. And in my opinion, he might be the best player in the history of the league to never win an MVP. Elgin Baylor. Yo, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It is, it, I, I kid you not. If there is one thing hella interesting about like rewatching this sport, watching 60s basketball is so fucking interesting, bro. It, it can be boring. Because a lot, because essentially just imagine watching like it's not even about the era. I think it's just basketball. Like, even today, imagine watching the Hornets versus Pistons on a ra uh, random Wednesday night. That That's just boring. You know what I'm saying? For the most part. Now, if the game was crazy, the game was crazy. But just in general, like, basketball right now can be boring. You know what I'm saying? And, and these games in the past were not different uh, from that aspect. But some people... I feel like a lot of y'all in chat have this perception as well. Y'all think 60s basketball, just because it was black, uh, black and white and because it was from uh, 60 years ago, was slow-paced, no skill at all, no flash to the game. When I saw some of the moves Bob Cousy was pulling off, I was like, yo, hold on, what the, what? What the fuck? Like, <laughs> I saw some of the shots Jerry West was taking, and I was like, I ain't gonna lie, and this is what confuses me about basketball without a three-point line. Why would you shoot that far out when, like, it's just worth two points? You know what I'm saying? I, what I do want to do uh, this summer with y'all is watch full games. Watch full retro games. Cannot do it on YouTube. I'll probably do it on kick, though. I'll probably do it on kick. So, mods, if y'all can spam up the kick link in the chat, go ahead and follow me on kick. I'll, I'll do those on there. Probably clip them up for the YouTube. But the actual full live streams, I think I'm going to do those on kick. Does kick have a nap? Yes, they do. Baylor and West formed one of the greatest duos in the history of the league, despite never winning a championship together. Well, this Before is Baylor came along, the NBA was mostly a horizontal game, aka a bunch of white guys who couldn't jump. Baylor brought some verticality to it, and the old heads loved to compare him as a precursor to Dr. J and Michael Jordan. Although injuries would later sap him of some of his effectiveness, pre-injury Baylor was a monster both as a scorer and as a rebounder. And to this day, he still holds the single single game record for most points scored in an NBA Finals game, which happened in 1962. He averaged 41 points, 18 rebounds, and 4 assists in the 1962 Finals, but lost. I guess he just didn't have enough killer instinct. And finally, Bill Appreciate Russell. I have man. to Appreciate admit that Bill Russell is one of the toughest players for me to judge because even for his era, he was not a great offensive player. He was a talented passer, an amazing rebounder, and considered by many to be the greatest defender of all time. And to be honest, that distinction shout out shout out the big bill man listen listen i think bill russell was so ahead of his fucking time so so ahead of his time i understand he was not the scorer that the four other dudes that i mentioned were i understand that but his defensive presence was something else and what i mean by that is like his versatility on the defensive end goes so unnoticed. We're talking about a guy that you can put on Wilt Chamberlain, and he can also switch on an Elgin Baylor and on a Jerry West and hell and hold his own like pretty fucking well. You know what I'm saying? Um on the offensive end. I, we're, you know, we're, we're watching the finals right now. We're seeing a lot of Jokic bringing, bringing the ball up. I wouldn't say, like, Bill Russell was doing that routinely, but he did that a decent amount, a lot more than you think. 
initiating fast breaks. You know, like the fast break, from my understanding, wasn't even a concept until the 1960s Celtics really popularized it. And Bill Russell was like the initiator of those fast breaks. So like what you, what what we're seeing from a Jokic right now, from a Kevin Love, um, you know, later down in this era, like a Wes Unseld, like Bill Russell was a forefront leader in that. Again, chat, correct me if I'm wrong, but literally the concept of blo uh, jumping to block shots was not a thing until Bill Russell came along. I understand you can look at that eight. Hey, that you know that just shows how trash the game was back then. I guess, but I think that just gives credence to how advanced Bill Russell was for that time. And I don't know, man. the 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 playmaking too. The playmaking was was low key. Uh, you know, was underrated. The Celtics ran a lot of uh dribble handoff action back then. Head of the time, man. Head of his time. To have some merit, RIP. You look at how he dominated defensive win shares and how amazing his Celtics teams always were defensively relative to their era. Also, before he goes forward, he was, in my opinion, the original Tim Duncan. In terms of, I truly think Bill Russell had the capabilities to average more points than he did. I think he had the capability to average 25, 26 a game if he really wanted to. And you can, you can look up interviews of Will Chamberlain talking about him versus Bill Russell as well, and this is what he'll attribute Bill Russell to, is that because of how Bill Russell played basketball, and I said the same thing about Jimmy, Jimmy plays basketball in a way that's so unselfish that it allows the Max Struces, the Gabe Vincents, the Duncan Robinsons of the world to step up and the whole team becomes more dangerous, Bill Russell was the exact same way. If Bill Russell played like Wilt Chamberlain and just went for 50 a game, I'm pretty sure he can come, pl come close to it, maybe 38-40. But it was because of the way that he played basketball that allowed a Sam Jones to succeed, allowed a Tom Heinsohn to succeed. You know what I'm saying? Allowed a Bob Cousy to succeed. You know? Shit like that. And things of that nature. Russell never once led his own team in scoring, and he remains the only legend that I have my reservations about how he would transfer to today's game. But my God, the guy won nine out of 10 years in the 1960s, and regardless of teammate support or level of competition, no other player or superstar has ever repeated that type of dominance. And at a certain point, the team accomplishments become too much to ignore. Player of the decade, Wilt Chamberlain. I gotta be honest, it sounds a little bit weird to give Wilt the nod after I I just gave Russell credit for winning 90% of the championships in the era, but to me, it's player of the decade, and Wilt was the best individual player, but this debate has been going on for nearly six I'd, years I'd go now. Bill. Do you I'd go Wilt's Bill. Wilt's stats cool. or Russell's team wins and head-to-head -head success, also, but I just could not... I'm, I'm just letting off my 60s knowledge right now. Listen, bro. Wilt Chamberlain... There's a lot of things people don't know about Will Chamberlain that, that I feel like would really turn motherfuckers off from Will Chamberlain. Number one, that video me and Sage reacted to, bro hates himself and his kind. Number one. Number two, the amount of choke jobs Will Chamberlain has had in his career. Boy. Boy, there's this perception. There is this per perception that the 60 Celtics were just so talented with all these Hall of Famers that they were just unbeatable every single year. When in reality, every single year, there was a series that went to seven. And I don't know about y'all, but if a team goes to seven, if there is a series every single year that goes to seven for a team, that means they're beatable. You know, like that, that means they're beatable. And how, and the amount of times Will Chamberlain, and also there's this perception that Will Chamberlain played with no help. He played with Hall of Famers too. He played with stars. You know what I'm saying? 
multiple Hall of Famers at the same time <laughs> type shit. The amount of times this dude has, has choked up in those big moments. How much Wilt Chamberlain stat padded people don't want to talk about. They don't, they don't they don't ever want to talk about that shit, bro. They don't. I think the in my opinion the most underrated choke job of all time that people just don't talk about because they just don't know. And it's cool, it's fine. You know what I'm saying? Motherfuckers think I'm a casual but don't even know this type of shit. This cool though. It's good. Yeah, it's cool. In Bill Russell's last year, he was the Celtics did not have a coach. Bill Russell was a player coach, right? So that, that that's one of the points. The second point of that year was, I believe, that was the first year that Wilt Chamberlain decided to go to the Lakers and team up with Jerry West and Elgin Baylor in their prime. So we're talking about Bill Russell in the last year of his career Going up against the other player, two of the top, what's that, th three of the top five players of the decade teamed up to beat the Celtics. Had a 3-2 lead. Game seven at home. And couldn't get it done. Yo, I'm, I'm just, if something like that happened in today's NBA, we would not hear the end of it. But because this dude averaged 50 points a game in a season, because this dude averaged, you know what I'm saying, like a hundred, uh, not, not, because he put up a hundred points in a game, because he has all of these individual statistical records, people hold him to like, and, and rightfully so, I don't blame people, people hold him to like this extremely high standard well, in reality, Will Chamberlain actually underachieved. I'm going to keep it a bean. I'm going to keep it a bean, bro. I ignore Wilt's individual production, even though he is one of the biggest playoff chokers of all time. The 1970s, Boom. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In my opinion, the 1970s are what I consider the lost decade of the NBA. There was never one dominant dynasty. The league was racked with drugs and the ABA sapped a lot of the talent for half the decade. But the one constant the entire decade was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar dominating and putting up historic numbers. He won five MVPs in the decade, as well as a championship That's and crazy. finals MVP. My my only gripe with Kareem is that for being the clear-cut best player in the decade by miles, he was only able to bring home one championship. Now, to be fair, he came within one game of winning a second championship in 1974, but still, he also missed the playoffs back-to-back -back seasons in his prime in 75 and 76. But nevertheless, there is no debating that Kareem was the best player in the league in the 1970s. But as you'll see, the star power drops off pretty quickly after him. Walt Frazier. Frazier is a legend both on and off the court. In the decade, he won two championships and very well could have and probably damn, should damn, have damn. been named the Shout 1970 out to Finals though, MVP instead of Willis Reed when he had an absolute right, dominant bad, Game 7 performance to bring home the Knicks' first championship ever. Clyde was also bad, known for raising his game in the postseason as his efficiency was incredible. A complete all-around player, he is one that could adapt to any era and excel in any era. Congrats to Clyde on weaving and achieving his way onto this list. Bob McAdoo. McAdoo had three straight 30 point per game seasons, including winning MVP in the early 70s. He kind of gets forgotten about because the entire 70s decade really gets forgotten about. And he played for that drop the off Buffalo is tough, Braves, bro. aka the Clippers before they moved. His team's also never really won. This, this is a decade that like, we're, we're three players in. Two, if you make a top 50 list, this is just my assumption. These are players like in the back half of that list, if they're even in it. That's tough right there, bro. That's tough. Anything with him in charge, but the guy could score the basketball. And people who saw him play compare him to Kevin Durant for what it's worth, minus the emotional threshold of a teenage girl. Bob Lanier. To me, Lanier is one of the most underrated players in the history of the league. He was a consistent 20, 25 point Damn. per game scorer 
That's as well the as 70s? A great rebounder and a capable passer. Really, the guy just did everything well. Unfortunately, his teams. This the yo chat. This the set. I go lie. 60s over the 70s, man. That if that's the hot take of the week. 19 the 60s are are to me a much more interesting era than the 70s, bro. No oh, cap. Never won anything in his prime, so he gets forgotten about, much like a lot of other great players from the 70s. When you look at his raw stats and his advanced stats, like I said, he really doesn't get nearly enough credit for how good he was. A white man. And finally, <laughs> Elvin Hayes. The Big E, as he was known, or the Big Enigma, was a little bit of a volume scorer in terms of getting his points, but he was a dominant rebounder and also blocked a lot of shots and got a lot of steals. However, he was also known to be a bit of a flake, especially in the postseason. Although he was able to win a championship in 1978. But even if he was a bit of a flake, him and Wes Unseld combined to create one of the best front courts in the history of the league. And it's pretty sad to say, but the last time Washington was title contenders was with Hayes in the late 70s. So yeah, it's... This dude put horn a check. You think about half a check, goofy. Come on. Look at this casual. <laughs> like, come on, look, look at this casual. I got the Trey Rags soundboard. <laughs> it's been a long Yo, chat is going crazy. What the Washington fuck? Wizards slash Bullets fans. And I just oh realized how much of a missed opportunity it was that Gilbert Arenas didn't play for Washington when they were named the Bullets. Player of the decade, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Like I said, my only gripe is that he could have won a couple more championships, but there's no debate here. The 1980s, Magic Johnson. Famous condom hater, Magic chat Johnson, chat also used to be chat very, right very good at basketball before he became oh, a legendary shit. tweeter. In the 1980s, he won three MVPs although they were kind of questionable, as well as five championships and three finals MVPs. He also missed the finals just two times in 10 years during the decade, and his presence All along... Right, let's, let's do predictions going into the 80s. Magic. Bird. Obviously. I'd put Isaiah Thomas in there. Curry. Kareem in two decades is crazy now. Um, if it's the 80s... Honestly, I, I... Is the 80s too soon for Jordan? Now, nah, because I'm thinking about Michael Jordan and Akeem right now. I do, I do know they came in the 84-85 season. So was what they did... In a five-year time span, more impressive than, I don't know, what, what Kareem did during this era. I, I think someone even put, um, whatchamacallit, Al Alex English, Moses Malone. Mo Mo Moses would probably be in there with Larry Bird awesome. was a big reason why the NBA soared in popularity after the nightmarish PR decade of the 1970s when finals games were on tape delay. Larry Bird. You can't really talk about Magic Larry Johnson Bird. or Larry Bird or vice versa without mentioning the other pretty quickly as their legacies are intertwined as they entered the league together in the same year in 1980, met three times in the finals and exchanged MVPs and championships for basically the entire decade. Really not much I can say about Bird that you already don't don't know. He came in, had an immediate impact on the Celtics, and his three-year stretch in the mid-80s when he won three straight <laughs> MVPs, as well as two of his three championships, is one of the best stretches by any player in the history of the league. As I've said before in pre- You know, if there's one thing I don't get about Bird, and I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, every time people um, bring up those top five shooters of all time pictures, and Bird isn't in there, Everyone in the replies go to answer on who is missing from this list is always Larry Bird, bro. And I just don't get it. Like, I'm, I'm being so, like, how can you look at a player who for some playoff runs didn't even average 1-3 a game and say he's a better shooter than a lot of dudes and, like, come, I don't know, bro. I can't, I can't. It like if eighty six is his best playoff um shoot, three point shooting run. I look at, looking at the rest. That's an anomaly, bro. I don't know. Previous videos of mine. I think I don't Bird's know, playoff career gets a little bit overrated as because at that point, if we're thinking about shooting from like you know 
the dribble pull-up angle, the mid-range, you know, that type of shit, then that's a whole different conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm putting Kobe in that that list. I'm putting Kyrie in that list. If that's... Jesus Christ, the chat is going crazy again. But, like, if, if that's what we're doing, if it's about who are the best shooters of all time from all aspects of perimeter shooting, that's a whole different conversation. I don't know, man. We had a couple truly legendary postseason runs compared to his reputation, but still, you can't talk about the 80s NBA without Larry Bird. And if he wasn't so inclined to pave his mother's driveway, maybe I'm he would have ended up I understand he's a, he's a good shooter for us. Instead of retiring early because of back problems. Michael Jordan. Believe it or not, there was a time when Michael Jordan wasn't winning championships every single season. Me and so, he was considered to be a ball hog who was a great individual player that you could never win with because because he wasn't an all-around player like Magic and Bird. It's ironic because a lot of MJ's best individual seasons came in the 80s before he won any championships, as I alluded to. But still, even though MJ wasn't winning rings Y'all yet, see those numbers, chat, he actually bro? played against great teams as opposed to the dog he was facing shit. in the 90s, he still was able to win three scoring titles, oh, an MVP, yeah. Defensive Player of the Year. Chad, do y'all see these numbers? <laughs> oh my, you know... <laughs> It's so easy to forget why people think Michael Jordan is the GOAT. And then you just look at his numbers, the runs he had, his accolades as a whole, his impact on the game, consistency, the advanced stats, and you're just like, damn, okay, okay. okay. Okay, he's in this conversation for a reason. You know, like, God damn, bro. And also had some memorable moments in the postseason, such as his 63-point game versus the Celtics in 1986 after missing most of the season with a broken foot. Luckily for Michael, he wasn't born a couple years earlier, and he wouldn't have to face the Showtime Lakers or the Bird Celtics or the Bad Boy Pistons more this than is he did. Insane but the 80s proved up, that bro. Jordan was a great player regardless of situation, as well as one of the greatest athletes and fun-to-watch players that we've ever seen. What I just wish that his fans were a little bit more self-aware when they give excuses for Jordan losing in the 80s while tearing down other certain players for losing series where they put up amazing numbers against far superior teams. Moses Malone. Moses had one of the most interesting careers of any all-time great. He played for a bunch of teams, including four in the decade of the 80s. That last spot gotta be Hakeem or Kareem, though. I don't know who I'd get. Oh, no, no, no. He doesn't have Isaiah in this list. I'd put Isaiah on this list, bro. So right now he has L Magic, Larry... Michael Moses. You got to put Isaiah in this list, bro. No, no way. No way. Because Isaiah definitely wasn't the 1990s. Definitely wasn't, like, if if we're talking about Isaiah, it has to be the 80s. Isaiah got to be on here, man. While also winning two MVPs, a championship, and a finals MVP early on in the decade. I do have some reservations about how he would translate to later eras, as he wasn't a great passer and a bit slow-footed defensively. But he was a man of his time, and there's no doubt that he took full advantage of it. Hey, no, no spoilers, bro. Oh, I'm superstar looking this way now. Ever saw. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem's... Ah, oh, Lee. Uh, that's where I disagree like crazy. That's where I disagree. Maybe I let me let me see what Big Reem was doing in this era for. Also, side note, the vibes with the with the light in the background. I, I like this right here. Let me see what Big Reem was doing in this era, bro. Big Reem. So he's saying from eighty. Okay, so he did play the whole decade. Number one. We're talking about. I can't even say 10. 20 and 8. 20 and 8 for the whole era. On what looks like crazy efficiency. Yeah, that that's that's crazy efficiency. Um great shot blocker for the whole, you know, the whole time. Uh what call it? 
I'm blanking on it right now. Oh, I was looking at the, the championships. I, oh, he got five rings in this this time. I, I'd, I'd, give, I'd give the edge to Kareem. I'd give the edge to Kareem over Hakeem. I'm going to keep it a bean, and maybe I'm crazy for this. If I were to bounce, bounce out one person in this era, it would probably be Mike. It would probably be Mike. Maybe I'm bugging on that. But what Moses did in this era... In my opinion, was more significant than what um, MJ did in those five years, especially with how he's talking about it. Yeah, my my five would probably be Magic, Larry, Moses, Kareem, and Isaiah. That's just me, though. decade in the 80s wasn't nearly as dominant individually as he was in the 70s, but he was still able to squeak in another MVP, a finals MVP, and win five of his six rings. I do love how basically <laughs> after 1981, he just decided to give up rebounding for good. And I do find it interesting that the first decade of his career, he won five of his six MVPs and one of his six rings. And in the second decade of his career, he won five of his rings and only one of his six MVPs. Just a little something to consider when ranking him all time, which I could Consider him to be a top three player ever. And the fact that he was still averaging about 23 points a game and 26 points per game in the playoffs at age 38 says a lot about his greatness. I do want to quickly point out that at age 38, he had about 10,000 fewer career minutes played in the league than LeBron does at 38. So for the LeBron haters seeing this video, just some more context for you to consider. Player of the decade, Magic Head Johnson. Ass. Some people would say it should be tied between Magic and Bird, but I give Magic the edge because I think he was a more consistent postseason and finals performer than Bird was. Johnson was so good at basketball that he has the best porn name of all time and is also famous for having HIV and people don't even connect the two. The 1990s, aka the most overrated decade of any sport in sports history. Michael Jordan, oh, you pretty much know all of MJ's accomplishments in the 1990s by now. Six rings, six finals MVPs, four MVPs, a bunch of scoring titles. Like, look at this run, bro. Holy shit. Hey, listen, take, take, the, take the Braun Jordan conversation out of it. Look at this run, bro. 36 and 7. <laughs> 36 and 7. Averaged two steals a game. Some seasons closer to three. Averaged a block a game. Shot 50% from the field. 80 to, you know, 84% from the line. The three ball wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't like horribly bad as well. He's not a three point shooter. But. Nah, man, that's crazy. And whatnot. He lost only two playoff series the entire decade when he wasn't quote unquote retired. You could easily argue that accomplishments wise, it's the greatest decade any player has ever had. In NBA. Look, like, look at these playoff numbers, bro. Like, I, li listen, listen, I understand when we have these conversations, like the six and O thing sounds, it, it's tiresome. When someone brings up the 6 and 0 thing, it's like, oh my god, you're going to 6 and 0 guy. Same thing with the, you know, if we're talking about rings, then Bill Russell's the, the GOAT guy. You know what I'm saying? But six, six, six of them bitches. This on six fingers. Like, like for real, for real, just, just let it settle in. Six rings. We, we we see how tough it is for teams to make one finals appearance. This dude led the Chicago Bulls to six finals appearances in one decade. Never lost. And three-peated twice? Like, c c come on, man. Come on, man. Like, <sighs> sometimes we get lost in the sauce in these conversations. You know what I'm saying? And we, uh, who cares? Uh, weak era. Uh, uh, yeah, he had a shit ton of help. He had X, Y, and Z. But sometimes, just gotta look back and, like, really appreciate what the fuck this dude has done. Regardless of the comparisons. Because cause I, I see, I see, uh, Jit from Florida, no comp at the wing position. 
again, just don't even look at, don't compare him to other people. If you can agree that 1990s basketball, at the very least, isn't a plumber era, don't don't think about the gold conversation right now. Don't don't think about what the resume looks like in comparison to a LeBron James, in comparison to a Steph Curry, to a Kobe Bryant. That that's a that's a crazy thing to do. That's an insane thing to do, man. Not too history, much on Jay. Not too course. much, MJ bro. MJ benefited from all the great teams in the 80s aging out and no team in the West ever winning the conference more than twice the entire decade. But credit to MJ and the Bulls. They took advantage of a weak era. But as they say, the winners get to write the story. Hakeem Olajuwon. If there was any player in the 90s that could have given MJ's Bulls massive issues that they never had to face in the finals, it was Hakeem. Simply put, Hakeem's legacy was cemented after his this back to back Amazing piece, title runs in Crazy. 94 and 95. If you wanted to be a hater, you could say that Hakeem benefited from Jordan being out of the league for most of those two years, even though technically MJ played 95 and he lost to the Magic in the second round. But let's keep that under wraps because it's. This dude averaged six blocks a game. This, <laughs> this dude averaged 26, 14, 5, 2, and 5 on 50. For 12 games? For 12 games? Chad! God! This dude is a monster! Doesn't go with the narrative. I'm just surprised God. that he was able to win the conference more than twice in the 90s. But there's no question that Hakeem is one of the great postseason performers of all time. Oh. Charles Barkley. It's very rare for a player to be both an I want to see if Scotty's going to be an underachiever at the same time, but that's kind of what Barkley was. I want to see if Scotty's undersized for a power forward. Shaq got to be in four, too. But he was Bro was drafted in 90. The reason he played power forward as opposed to shooting. Or does he? Now I'm thinking about David Robinson. Jordan, Chuck. So you got Jordan, Hakeem, Chuck right now. My last two would be David, uh, David Robinson, Shaquille O'Neal. Ooh, Car Carl Malone's another one. Carl Malone, Bozo Malone. We're just talking strictly about basketball. He should be in that conversation as well. Um, I feel like I'm blanking on a name over here. I feel like I'm blanking on a name. Oh, Scotty Pippen. Yeah, yeah, Scott. Someone's gonna be left out, bro. Guard or a guard role is because he Clyde? wasn't good at shooting, but he made up for that with his incredible post play. That said, he was also famous for consistently coming. I, I think I think the problem with Clyde's career is a lot of it happened in the late '80s and in the early '90s. So it's like half of it half of his career was only for half a decade, the other half was for another half of another decade type shit. Coming into seasons out of shape and for really not trying on defense, which might have led to him never winning a championship. He only made one finals, which famously came against MJ's Bulls in 93, but wasn't able to seal the deal. When you hear Barkley talk about really anything, but especially basketball, it's very hard to remember that he was one of the best players ever. And to me, he was the second best non-big man of the 90s behind MJ. Carl Malone. In the 90s, one of the biggest debates was who was the best power for- Second best non-big man behind MJ. <laughs> The fuck? <laughs> um. So he put Carl Malone. Hey, listen. Forward in the league was that last Carl one or Barkley? I I've think it's gonna be between D. Malone, Robin no and Shaq, and his bro. His weaknesses in the postseason, and to me, he's and the Scottie. biggest choker in the history of the league. But at the same time, if you're going to say something good about Carl Malone, which there's not a lot of good, and I'm gonna be honest, if 99 counts. Hey, listen, D. Rob might got a. Hey, David Robinson might be the pick. Low key, low key. Things to say, but this is a basketball video. No, no he spoilers, chat. No, no spoilers. Regular season performer, and if Charles Barkley if this had just from 1990 to 1999, might have won a couple championships. But instead, I don't know, rings, bro. But at least Barkley is actually not a terrible human being. Shaquille O'Neal. For Damn. me, there were a couple players up for the last spot on this list, but I went with Shaq over David Robinson specifically because I felt Shaq was Scotty the more Pickle dominant even player, even though Robinson did win a championship in the 90s, albeit as a second option behind. 
behind Tim Duncan. One interesting thing to note is that for all of Shaq's dominance, he got swept five times in the decade, which is really just an interesting stat to me, although I don't really care because whether you're getting swept or you lose in six or seven, you still lost the series. It's basically two cheeks of the same ass. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. But, but, oh my God. I'm just saying, dog. I'm just saying. If Joel Embiid... He, let's, let's just even give him the benefit of the doubt. Made it out the second round. But he got swept five times. <laughs> oh, Lee, bro. Jeez Louise. What you mean I want to talk about the Celtics? I don't want to talk about the Celtics right now. But I'm just saying, bro. Like, if Joel Embiid got swept five times... Like, oh, we suck a little bit less than you. Okay, that's great. Player of the decade, Scotty Pippen. Just kidding. I know you Jordan fans were pissed for a second. Obviously, it's Michael Jordan. Let's move on. 2000s, Tim Duncan. The big fundamental sure left his mark on the first decade of the new millennium, winning two MVPs, three rings, and two fi- All right, let's, let's, do, let's do predictions. Let's keep it. Let's keep it pushing. Tim, Kobe. Shaq got to be up there, even though the the later half of the decade wasn't really wasn't really strong. KG, and that last one's gonna be tough. Dirk, wait, oh shit, I'm I'm so I'm so dumb, I am so dumb, chat. Please, 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 please. Let me let me let me let me start over. Let me start over. Tim, Kobe, Braun. Conversation starts there. Shaq. Okay, that last one. That last one. Now that last one. That last one's tough, bro. Finals MVPs in the stretch. He was a consistent playoff riser and somehow never won Defensive Player of the Year despite his teams and his defensive metrics always being incredible defensively. I will say that although a lot of people talk about him being underrated, I'm not sure he is. Some people might argue that his great moments don't get talked about as much as somebody like Kobe Bryant, and that might be true, but that cuts that both old, ways. Playing in a small market run, like bro. San Antonio might not get you as much national Holy. attention consistently, but your flaws and your short... This is crazy because Tim Duncan's career you don't even think of him as a carry job dude like at all when in reality he actually had one of the craziest carry jobs of all time like Cummings, shit is nuts, as well as your shit playoff failures also get forgotten about and less talked about as well and for as great as Duncan was he did have his down moments just like every player but nevertheless when talking about the Nash. best players in the 2000s Tim Steve yo what Steve Nash Steve, Steve Nash. In the most talented era from a superstar level of all time. We're talking about motherfuckers that won rings. At this point. At this point, a finals appearance is mandatory. Two MVPs, questionable MVPs, is gonna get you there, gang. Oh damn, it's done. That's tough. Come on, dude. Come on, come on, come on, dude. Duncan better be one of the very first names out of your mouth. Kobe Bryant. Kobe Steve is also Nash. one of the toughest players to rank all time because he was great for most of his career, but not always, and he was a sidekick for the majority of his rings, yet he also later won championships as the best player. So there's a lot of context needs to be applied. The but B, there's man. no debate that Kobe is one of the best players of all time, and his best seasons came in the 2000s, so that's why he's here. Duh. He won four championships, an MVP and a finals MVP in the decade, as well as some of the most famous scoring exploits in the history of the game, including an 81-point game against Toronto in 2006. Stylistically, he was a carbon copy of Michael Jordan okay. with amazing skill and technical abilities. My biggest gripe with Kobe as a player is that he wasn't a consistently great finals performer relative to his gargantuan standards, but his consistency and know. longevity makes him a must-add to any conversation about the greatest players of all time, specifically this decade. LeBron James. Because it's LeBron and a lot of 
people hate LeBron, they're probably gonna say, why is he on this list? He didn't start winning championships until the 2010s. And for that, I say, go fuck yourself. 2000s <laughs> LeBron is basically the equivalent of 1980s Michael Jordan. Incredible yeah. stats, freakish athleticism, an MVP, and no rings. But to me, the individual production on a per game level the in both the regular I'm just saying, and no postseason Shaq was before. too much no. for him to be left off. Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq makes this list based off of the first three years of the decade where he okay. had arguably the most dominant three-year stretch in the history of the league and won three straight championships and three straight finals MVPs as well as a league MVP. Of course, as we all know with Shaq, he pretty much fell off during the second half of the decade. But all right, I, need, I need predictions. So my first four was his first four. That last spot, KG, Dirk, Wade, who else, who else? KG, Dirk, Wade, T-Mac, <clears throat> fuck out of here. JK, that, you know, J JK in there. I personally, personally, I'm gonna be, hey, shout to Eli, man. Uh, Why don't more teams try to have a Kobe slash Shaq he goes aside? Try to have a Kobe, Shaq, Egos. What? Wait, what does that, what does that mean? What does that mean? I, I don't I don't know what that means, Eli. If you can clarify in the chat. I listen, I'm I'm more so of a KG guy. So I'ma go KG, Kevin Wayne, Garnett. Probably go Dirk next. And then Wade. KG Shaq duo. KG Shaq duo. Um I don't I don't think it's a matter of want. It's more so a matter of can you get, you know, <laughs> that type of combination. To have a two way shot creator like a Kobe Bryant, in, in my opinion, from that alone, two way dominant shot creating ability. We're talking about, you know, a, a Jason Tatum. Type of guy, <laughs> type shit, pairing him up with a, a center that's extremely dominant in the post with a crazy post game that can control the pace of the game and be a great shot blocker. I think the closest thing you can come up with, you know, probably be like Tatum and Embiid on the same team. Like how. How hard is it to get a duo like that? Like it is extremely hard. You know what I'm saying? Who yo yo chat it? Who do you want me to say, bro? Who do you want me to say? Three level scorer, two way player that can shot create, have a crazy bag. Who do you want me to say, bro? D book, not not enough defense from Devin Booker. Sorry to tell you. Kawhi Leonard, not healthy enough. <laughs> Next person. From a talent perspective, it'd probably be Kawhi. I ain't gonna lie. Um, come on, dude. This ain't, this ain't Tatum dick suck. Come on, man. His peak was undeniably all-time great. And he also did win a fourth ring with Miami, although he wasn't the best player. Jimmy not a three-level scorer, bro. Me, it was he went Dirk? I guess. This I could guess, be a toss man. up between Dirk and KG. But I decided to go with Dirk because I felt he was a more consistent postseason. Brandon than Ingram. Was. Even though Garnett right, did bro. win a championship in the decade while Dirk didn't, although we all know that KG needed to go to a super team in Boston to finally get it done. I think you could certainly argue that Garnett was more all around skilled and talented than Dirk was, but at a certain point, production matters. And KG's postseason career with the Timberwolves was underwhelming, even considering the relative lack of talent that he had around him. Their resumes are extremely similar, and again, it is a toss-up, but I just went with the guy who I would trust in bigger moments more. I, I feel, I, I'm, I'm, not decade, I'm not Tim mad at Duncan. it. I'm not mad Duncan. Now, this is kind of hard to explain, because I have Kobe ahead of Duncan all time by a hair, but this is where the criteria that I had about specifically just this 10-year window, and 75% of Kobe's rings, three out of four, he was the second best player on his own team, whereas Duncan was the clear-cut best player, really, for 
all three of his rings, even though Tony Parker did win finals MVP in 2007. Either way, Duncan had more rings as the best player on his team in the decade, as well as more finals MVPs and more MVPs. But again, I can certainly see an argument for Kobe. It's simply a little bit of bad luck for Kobe, as if you included the 2010 championship, which just missed my cutoff rule by one year, I would have given Kobe the edge. But as it stands, Duncan edges out Kobe for I'm the not best player of the 2000s in my him. mind. 2010s, LeBron James. During the decade, LeBron won three rings, three finals MVPs, and three MVPs. And if it wasn't for some bad time injuries, like Kyrie getting hurt in 2015, and Kevin Durant joining the Warriors, who just won 73 games, there would be no argument about who the best player ever is, but I digress. That's not what this video is about. Honestly, 2018 might have been LeBron's most impressive accomplishment, even though it ended without a ring, as he dragged a absolutely abysmal Cleveland Cavaliers team to the finals. I'm not gonna lie, to me at this point, the LeBron conversation, it has nothing to do with rings at this point. The reason why I'm okay with even myself saying LeBron's the GOAT at this point is just from a, a, a longevity standpoint. Just, just from a longevity standpoint. I think just longevity alone pushes him. It, longevity alone makes him like a top 15 player of all time, bro. Just that alone. This dude has been a top five player in the league since... Oh seven. Like that, his longevity is just fucking insane, bro. His ability to adapt through different decades and different eras is insane. Different teams, different coaching styles, insane. You know what I'm saying? Good solo squad, great help defender. I don't even want to, you know what I'm saying, go crazy with the gawk, but and should have won game one against the most talented team ever assembled. But again, I digress. I'm trying not to get angry here. Nevertheless, if you don't think LeBron was the best player of the decade, while simultaneously holding him to higher standards than anybody else, you're a moron. Kevin Durant. While KD's all-time legacy is hotly debated, there's no doubt that regardless of how you might feel about him personally, he's moved to Golden State. He is one of the best players of all time and easily one of the best players of the 2010. He won an MVP and four scoring titles during the decade. He led OK C2 a finals appearance in 2012 and yes he did technically win two rings and two finals MVPs with unbelievable numbers in 2017 <laughs> this dude he shot 56 44 89 <laughs> that when we talk about filler years bro and people just knowing it's a filler year from start to finish it was 2017 now I will say it was a great filler year. There was a lot of great basketball being played. You know what I'm saying? That was peak John Wall, peak Isaiah Thomas, um, peak Russell Westbrook. James Harden was going crazy. You know what I'm saying? That was last year of, of Spurs Kawhi Leonard. There was a lot of cool storylines going on in the season. So it was a good filler episode is what I'm saying. Good, good filler episode, but filler year, bro, Fill, filler year, a waste of a year of everyone's time, bro. The Christmas game was crazy, too. Some might even say it was the last real significant year of Kyrie's career. Every, every, every year since 2017 has either been injury riddled or he's just folded in the playoffs. 2017 was the last real, yo, Kyrie her, Kyrie's healthy for a majority of the season. You go into the playoffs, he's going to be one of the craziest playoff performers out there. You know what I'm saying? But. In 2018, but, well, I could make a 50-minute video about that. But again, I digress. Steph Curry, famous respecter of housing development, Steph Curry, has had a very unique path. Unlike most NBA superstars and legends who enter the league right away and very quickly become faces of the league, Steph flew under the radar for nearly the first four years of his career. But it was finally in year five where he broke out into an elite player. And then in year six, once Steve Curry really? came along, huh. that the year five... I think it was by year four, bro. Year four, people saw the writing on the wall, bro. Like, this dude is box office. Yeah. Specifically, that 54 he had against New York. Now, mind you, this is the 2013 Knicks now. That 54 he had in the garden. A little, uh... Ha! 
That shit was cold, bro. Where he broke out into an elite player. And then in year six, once Steve Kerr came along, that the beginning of the Warriors quote unquote dynasty began. As I've gone into detail about a lot of other videos, Steph has had plenty of luck along the way, but there is just no debating that this guy completely warps the court more than any other player ever with his supernatural shooting ability. Even after his slow first half of the decade, he still finished the 10 year run with three championships, two MVPs, including his magical 2016 regular season, which is arguably the greatest offensive season any player has ever had. Arguably. He also famously blew a 3-1 lead in the finals, but again, I digress. I'm not supposed to be talking about that, but I can't help myself because at my heart, I am a shit poster. Because of his unbelievable shooting ability, you can make the argument that if there was an all-time draft and you could draft any player ever at their very best, Steph might be one of the top three or four players off the list. But that being said, there is no doubt that his legacy does take a hit to anybody having a good faith argument by recruiting Durant at his peak had steph still let me, let me ask y'all this man let me ask y'all this can you be the greatest of all time without being a dominant defensive player because I, I i think i think you can you know crack top five crack top four but i'm talking about the best of the best you know what I'm saying? Like the greatest player to ever play the game. Can you be the greatest player to ever play the game without being dominant on the defensive end? And I'm not talking about good. Because I I would even argue that Curry's a, he's a good defender. But dominant... I don't know, but I also look at it from the perspective of like, okay, there's this player coming in. He's not the greatest defender. He's okay at defense. But let's let's just say hypothetically, bro gets six MVPs. He wins 10 rings, finals MVP every single time. At that point, it's like, okay, I understand like the defense ain't there. But like, come on, dog, 10, 10 rings, 10 finals MVPs. And, and six regular season MVPs. Ah! <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. The, the closest thing. And shout out to Drake. Shout out to Eli for the five. Shout out to Eli for the five. And I think, like, Drake, Drake Vic in the chat brings up, like, the closest thing to that is Bill Russell. It's kind of like the inverse of... Like, offensively, he's not there, but his defense is so great. And his accolades are so great. You know, like, can he be in that conversation? In my opinion, he's not my GOAT. He's not a lot of people's GOAT. But I think Bill Russell is in that conversation. I, th I think he is. I think he is. Now, with Curry, I just don't think the accolades are there for us to even start those conversations. But it's, you know, just a curious question that I got. Won those two championships in 2017 and 2018 without Durant, which was certainly possible considering how great Golden State already was. I think there would be a lot less toxicity around where he ranks all time. Chris Paul. After the top three of LeBron, KD, and Steph, it becomes a little challenging, actually, to choose the rest of the five. But to me, Chris Paul's consistency in the regular season was just too much to ignore, despite the fact that I've gone on record talking about how times. much of a disappointment he usually Chris is Paul in the postseason. You can make an argument pick. that regular season only, you could argue that only Magic Johnson is better than CP3. And I want to say in this scenario... So, so to fill out the rest, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Harden. No, I mean, y'all saying CP0, but like name names. CP3 is not a bad pick, yo. Not too much on Chris Paul. I hate it when y'all do this with Chris Paul, bro. Jesus Christ. Not too much on CP3, bro. I'm thinking Harden. I'm thinking Westbrook. I'm thinking Kawhi Leonard. And I'm going to be honest, from the start of the decade to the end of the decade, I'm fine with Chris Paul there. I'm fine. Dwayne Wade, nah. I, the individual dominance just wasn't there in the 2010s. Post 2012, to be honest with you. AD, it doesn't include 2020. So AD, AD is out of here. 
I'm gonna go. Hmm. I don't know. Actually, now that I'm looking at Chris Paul, I'm just I'm just saying with James Harden and Russell Westbrook on the board, Derrick Rose, please stop. I'm I'm just I'm just saying with James Harden and Russell Westbrook on the board, just from what they did in this era. I low key might take those two over Chris Paul just in this era. Because I'm looking at Chris Paul, 2018 and 2019 Chris Paul versus what Russ was in 2011, 2012, and then how Russ aged out in 18, 19. I might take Russ. I might, and he had the MVP year, was crazy good in 2015, 2016. I think if I, if I were to just pick, I would probably go Russ and Chris Paul snub out James Harden. But I wouldn't be mad if someone wanted to take out Chris Paul for James Harden. I'm considering Steph Blame as more of a hybrid guard as opposed to a point guard. But if you want to label Steph as a point guard, he gets put ahead of CP3 as well. Either way, CP3's longevity is amazing, despite the fact that he's an easy meme nowadays. I do wonder if his career would have been any different had David Stern not vetoed his trade to the Lakers in 2011. And finally, James Harden. I've gone back and forth at least 50 times in my mind between Harden Giannis. and Kawhi Leonard. But at the end of the day, I just could not ignore the gigantic mountain between the two in terms of production even though i believe Kawhi in a vacuum and especially in the playoffs is a more trustworthy play. wait so russ wasn't even damn 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 it was between Kawhi with him damn 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 player than Harden, who's one of the biggest... Where's Russ? Ever. That being said, Where's the Brody? The season, especially during his time with Houston, is one of the best players Damn. the game's ever seen. Whereas Kawhi really didn't take off as an individual superstar player until his fifth or sixth season. You know what? I'm ranting a little bit here. Again, simple argument. Kawhi, a better big game performer, but just not nearly enough sample size compared to Harden to earn the final nod. Player of the decade, LeBron James. Now, I know some of you are going to try and be smart asses and say, oh, well, Steph Curry you should probably be playing of the decade, but anybody who's honest with themselves knows that the easy answer is LeBron. As I said before, three rings, three MVPs, three finals MVPs, and a ridiculous eight straight finals appearances in the decade gives King James the crown. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm go LeBron as well. Just because what Curry was doing from like 11 to 14 and what LeBron was doing at that same time was leaps and bounds. Right, and then even when Curry came into the scene, LeBron was still like best in the world level. So it's like, what the what what the fuck are we arguing about? Like for real, for real, you know what I'm saying? So it's LeBron easy for me. I think Russell Westbrook got snubbed big time in these. Just not even the mention is crazy. Hey, shout out to Barry by the way, but not even the mention is crazy. Um, I think Isaiah Thomas got snubbed in the 80s. Shout out to Isaiah Thomas. Um, and then in the 2000s, I personally would have picked KG, but picking Dirk, ah, I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad at it.